Good evening and welcome to Musical Chairs. Um, no, I'm sorry. Welcome to the Institute of Politics Forum. My name is Ross Guerin and I'm the chairman of the Student Advisory Committee here. Um, before I turn this forum over to the director of the Institute, um, who's going to introduce the whole semester's fellows, I'd like to take just a few minutes to introduce all of you to the Institute of Politics as a whole. Um, first off, a little lingo. Uh, as you get more familiar with the Institute, you'll start calling it the IOP, as we will, just so you don't get confused. And you'll call the Student Advisory Committee the SAC. Um, and the SAC is a manager for the Institute of Politics. It's made up of about 30 students, primarily undergraduates. Um, members of the SAC chair about a dozen subcommittees which plan and execute forums like this, study groups, brown bag lunches, uh, summer in Washington and summer in Boston programs, and numerous other activities. Um, each subcommittee is staffed by students, mostly undergrads, which means that hundreds of people, just like some of you undergrads out there in the audience, are getting involved in planning events here throughout the semester. Now, I encourage you to come to us with your ideas and energy, and this goes for undergrads as well as graduate students, members of the community. If you have ideas, we want to hear them. Now, you may wonder what purpose does all this serve? Why spend so much time involved with politics, notably apart from the daily rigors of academic life? Why, in addition to classes, go to a study group or a lunch? Why teach civics in Boston junior high schools, another thing we do? Why, after spending the morning in a lecture room with 200 other students, come listen to more speeches and politicians at that? After all, don't we hear enough about you guys on McNeil Lair and in the Times and the Globe? Well, as you probably guessed, the answer is in our mission, a mission we do believe in pretty fanatically, a mission to inspire and empower people, to encourage people to be motivated by ideas of what a better school, community, or world would be like. Now, when the Institute was founded back in 1966 <coughs> as a living memorial to John F. Kennedy, the idea was to have a place on campus which bridged the worlds of politics and academia. The idea was to especially target undergraduates and to convince us and you early on to get involved in politics. And the mission is still the same. The Institute of Politics serves as advanced training in civic responsibility. We want to help you form a habit of public service. If you come down here just a couple of times a year to talk to a fellow, to attend a study group, to listen to a candidate, we want you to feel how easy it is, really, to get involved. And that involvement can run the gamut from simply making educated decisions about which presidential candidate you'll support and vote for, um, to sharing your ideas with elected representatives, or hopefully someday to running for office yourself. Well, these people on the stage here, the fellows, each of in their own ways hearken to the call of civic responsibility, and they're going to share with you their stories. These people are here to inspire. I'm just here to soften you up. Um, I know that one brief set of comments isn't going to make you commit your life to public service, and one short speech isn't even necessarily going to make you act. But somewhere, the message is going to click. These people have devoted their lives to acting to make things better. Listen to them and allow yourself to be inspired. Please join me in welcoming the moderator for this evening's discussion, the former mayor of Seattle and the director of the Institute of Politics, Charlie Royer. Thank you very much, Ross. As Ross so eloquently stated, one of the ways in which we carry out our mission uh, at the Institute of Politics is to bring people of distinction from the world of politics and journalism uh, into the Institute uh, every semester so that they might teach in our not-for-credit not courses and so that they might interact with students and others in the larger community. Uh, as usual, we have uh, a very interesting mix of fellows uh, for this spring semester. I'm going to introduce each, ask each to um, make brief comments, and then we'll open the floor for questions. On my right, Tom DeMoore comes to us fresh from his job as Chief of Staff to Governor Lowell Weicker of Connecticut. I say fresh from his job. He'll be fresh when he leaves here. He ran Governor Weicker's 1982 Senate campaign, served as chair of the state's Republican Party. His study group is appropriately called, Is the Party Over for the Two National Political Parties? Next to Tom is John Hart, who is a most familiar face to all of us, having worked for the past 20-plus years for CBS, NBC, and for uh, World Monitor. He has been a political correspondent, an anchor, and foreign correspondent, and always a thoughtful commentator on journalism. His study group is entitled Conflicts of Interest in the News Business. Next to me is an old colleague and friend, Bill Hudnut of Indianapolis, who is coming off 16 years as one of the nation's most effective big city mayors. 
He served a term in Congress. He's a Presbyterian minister. He wrote a book called The Minister Mayor, and his study group is called Cities Under Siege, Urban America. Next to me is Yelena Kanga, who brings to the Institute of Politics one of the most interesting bios we've ever had. She's a newspaper and television journalist from Moscow, has spent the last year at the Rockefeller Foundation writing a book on the history of her family, which will be a movie. Her study group is called The Commonwealth of Independent States, Can It Last? Next to Yelena is Betsy Wright, whose most recent job was as uh, serving for a year as chair and executive director of the Democratic Party of Arkansas. For 10 years prior to that, she served as chief of staff and campaign manager for a well-known governor of Arkansas who is probably somewhere up north tonight in New Hampshire. She has a very rich background in politics at many levels and will teach a study group here called High Tech Politics, The Future is Here. Our final fellow is the former governor of Louisiana, Buddy Romer, who because of a longstanding commitment to the people who elected him governor is tonight actually in Louisiana. Governor Romer's study group, as you might suspect, will be about governors and the politics of government. <coughs> so let's start with Tom DeMore. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. They told us uh, earlier to make this uh, personal and relaxed, so I'm going to make it very personal and very relaxed and tell you a little bit of the odyssey of how I got where I am. My dad sold vacuum cleaners door to door. And on Fridays, I would get to drive to Hartford, uh, Connecticut with him to sales meetings. And on alternate Fridays, we'd stop by the state capitol to visit a relative who worked there. As I recall, he was uh, an elevator operator. And one day, in the parking lot, my dad said, how would you like to meet the governor? I was about 10 years old. And I said, terrific. Well, the governor then was, uh, to date myself, it was John Lodge. He walked up to the governor and said, Governor, I'd like you to meet my son, Tom, which he did. And that was the first sort of uh, white lie that I was told that got me interested in politics. As I lived to the age of about 18, thinking all that time that my dad knew the governor. <laughs> and he didn't. <laughs> Never met him. And I remember telling my mother when I decided to get active in politics, as I blame it on your dad because he got you started and introduced you to the governor, and I asked her at that time if he knew him and had the impression that he had and, and was off to the races. From that point on, it was activity in, uh, in the highest way with a thing called Boy State, a young group of people that got to go off and practice uh, politics, mock government for a month. And at the highest level, again, I was a campaign manager for someone who wanted to run for lieutenant governor. And uh, he wasn't very popular, and at about 1 o'clock in the morning, someone um, who had cheese sandwiches and I had balloons decided to make an arrangement. We supported his guy for lieutenant governor in return for the cheese sandwiches. They got the balloons, and we won the election. <laughs> From there, I moved to a small town and then really got into it. First mistake you can make at a group like this at a thing called a town meeting, I got up and asked a question. I asked somebody where my kids were going to be picked up on the school bus route. The next thing I knew, I was on the town committee. <laughs> I got on the town committee after a long deliberation and thoughtful uh, uh, process about uh, whether I'd be a Republican or a Democrat um, on the basis of uh, the first person who came up and asked me to get involved. And there's a lesson in that that's always stayed with me, and it's about people. It wasn't to do with an institution or a philosophy. It was about a very thoughtful, kindly, elderly lady who came up to me in a small town and said, why don't you join us and go to work and do something for your community, which I did. When I served on the Board of Education. I was elected uh, by a landslide, one vote, and that set me on a course for never running for office again <laughs> and becoming a, uh, what I think is a campaign, uh, campaign manager par excellence. I made a lot of notations, and I can't help but pause at this point uh, because of where we are. And I'm sure a lot of people in this room will remember where they were on the day that the man this school is named for was killed. That's John F. Kennedy. 
was a very moving moment. I'm not ashamed to say that uh, I was pulling out of a driveway at, at a school and uh, stopped my car, cried like a baby, and I watched a building of people empty out youngsters, most of them not uh, you know, high school agent, not much younger than some of the folks I'm looking at here. And the thought occurred to me in preparing some of these notes is that what a wonderful time that was in, in one respect, and that is that it was a time when people would cry for their leaders. And if we could make politics again something where we felt strongly enough about one another to cry for leaders, that maybe we would develop leaders that cared enough about people and people about each other. That's always had a lasting um, impression on me. I, I never thought I'd wind up where I am, and I can't tell you how delighted I am and how much I look forward to discussing and learning about politics with some of the people here, especially the undergraduate students. I have six youngsters. They range in age from 25 to 17. So I really welcome the opportunity. I've, uh, I don't scare easy, and uh, my bark and my bite are all gone because I've wasted it on those six <laughs> youngsters, so I'll be easy to, <laughs> easy to talk to. From there, my experience in government really was kind of roller coaster. I volunteered for a man who was elected to Congress, who then became governor of the state of Connecticut. And that was in the early 70s, and I lived through something called Watergate. Uh, went into politics with the highest of hopes, saw them dashed, and I think we're still paying the price today in terms of people's willingness to be involved. And then I got out of politics for about five or six years. Then I got asked to run a campaign for a man named Lowell Weicker for the United States Senate in 1982. And we were successful in that effort. It was a wonderful experience. And then I got out of politics. And then I got back in again in 1990 to run one of the most exciting campaigns in my life because it really was about people and not about parties. And uh, that was in 1990, and he was elected as independent to governor. And I got out of politics again, and maybe I'll be rested when I go back. And the reason for that repetition is that I, I firmly believe that maybe there is something to getting in and out and to being grounded and, and back and close to people. That's generally my story, and I started it with my dad, and I want to end it with my mom. It gives you some idea about my identity and what's happened to politics and my lifetime. And my dad comes from a long tradition of Democrats. And I lost my father two years ago. And my mother came up to me not too long ago in the midst of the Weicker campaign, and we formed a thing called a Connecticut Party. And my mother who's not terribly sophisticated, but very, very smart, said, I'm not sure exactly what it is you're doing. I'm very proud of you. Said, and I think your father would be proud of you, too, because he never really liked your being a Republican. <laughs> said, I'm not sure, I'm not sure exactly what you are, but you seem headed in the other direction. So I don't know what direction I'm, I'm headed in. I am here to learn something about that and impart some knowledge about that. And I don't know that the direction is as important as the people that we serve. And uh, I hope to gain some insights into that, and I really look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. John Hart. Well, um, we were asked to make this personal, and I don't think there's really any other way that I can look back on life and, and, and journalism. I can't think, I can't imagine a better way to have spent my life. Um, I grew up in a small town in Oregon called Corvallis. There were 7,000 people in it when the college was not in session, and when Oregon State convened, there were 15,000 people in it. There was uh, the First Baptist Church. There was no Second Baptist Church. <laughs> there was a newspaper, the Gazette Times, that um, put out a paper every day, eight pages long. And uh, maybe uh, 10 or 12 column inches of that was international news. We didn't have a lot of the outside world coming into Corvallis. Um, we did uh, have the uh, Reader's Digest, and uh, we had KOIN in Portland, Oregon. We had a radio in the living room. 
about this big. It was made of wood, and it had um, vacuum tubes in it, and a little round tube in the front, you know, it was green. Have you seen those things? A little pie shape, so that when you get close to the station, the, pie, the piece of pie gets smaller. Yeah, okay. Well, that was wonderful. <laughs> And uh, on, on that radio, I began hearing a little bit about the world. I was seven years old when the Anschluss occurred in Austria and when we began hearing through the CBS correspondence about the invasion of Poland. And then there was Dunkirk, Edward R. Murrow's voice coming over, all the way over from London, relaying the reports. We heard the Battle of Britain. We heard the voice of Winston Churchill. We heard um, John Charles Daly interrupt on a Sunday morning and say that the island of Oahu had had visitors from Japan. And uh, later, a couple of days later, we heard Franklin Roosevelt live calling that a day that will live in infamy. Well, that's the beginning of some of the influence in my life. One of the other influences was that my father was the pastor of that First Baptist Church. And we had to go to church four times on Sunday and were strongly encouraged to go to, to prayer meeting on Thursday. <laughs> Sunday school, church, young people's church, and then, of course, there was always the fireside singing after church. The influence that stayed with me, although the faith fell away, I must admit, was the cadences that I heard from the pulpit and read in the King James Version of the Bible. Those of you who have poetry in your souls and a soulmate, I strongly encourage you to find the King James Version of the Bible and read just the first chapter of Genesis, which begins, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep. And it goes on in those cadences. Well, it only occurred to me in recent years that large events came in those cadences. When the Germans surrendered, uh, Edward R. Murrow, he must have read it or felt it. His announcement was, the organized killing ended in Europe today. The same cadence large events. And I found that when I was writing in later years, whether it was about Vietnam or whether it was covering the Kennedy, Senator Robert Kennedy's campaign, whether it was in Tehran or China, that it felt right for some reason that came back. Well, the voices I heard reporting all of those events when I was back in Corvallis now were those of Eric Severide and uh, Robert Trout and Murrow and all of that gang. These were men who, um, who didn't fly in on an airplane for the event. They were there. They spoke the language. Shirer spoke German and covered Germany until he was kicked out. People who covered France, Larry Lasseur, spoke French. They were there, they knew the history, they knew the culture, they knew the people, they knew the leaders, they knew the followers, so they didn't have to read up a lot. Well, <clears throat> when I decided, uh, I should in parenthesis also admit that on that same radio I did a lot of listening to Captain Midnight, <laughs> Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy, uh, the romance of Helen Trent, was it to Stella Dallas? Can a girl from a small mining town in Colorado find <laughs> happiness with England's richest, most handsome lord? <laughs> yes. Yes. Very easy. So, when I, later on when I decided I probably didn't want to be a radio actor and a movie actor, I studied history in college. And it came to me that the only thing I ever really wanted to be was a CBS News correspondent. And I couldn't believe it when I got to be. Um, I did some radio broadcasting in college and 
took some graduate work in journalism at UCLA and got to know some people and got a job in a local station and they sent me to Washington to run the uh, station's bureau that the company owned and then one of my former employers had moved to New York and mentioned my name and they called me to New York one day and said how would you like to work for CBS News well I couldn't believe it after I got the job and was posted to the south in 1965 I told my wife, I said, do you know how many senators there are? There are a hundred senators. You know how many CBS News correspondents there are? There are like two dozen. It was really great. <laughs> but the greatness of it was, personally, that I got to see the events of my time up close and the people who were making the events happen or who were also the victims of those events. Uh, we were talking earlier with Bill about the day that Robert Kennedy came to an Indianapolis. That was the same day Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. I was covering the senator's campaign for president that year. And later, uh, his death in Los Angeles, the riots, the war in Vietnam. I won't go through all of that list of things. But it gives you a sense of having lived in your time. And I really wish that, that, that the world was a little more the way it used to be in that the organs who are covering the news today could offer the young people here the support, the vision, the drive, the commitment to information and, and uh, that, that we experienced. I don't want to uh, bring out a list of complaints. I have to admit I did resign from my last three jobs. And that <laughs> but the fact is that about 12 years ago, the direction changed. And this is all I want to say about this, because I want to tell you one story, and then I'll quit. But the direction changed for various reasons, mostly financial. The financial reason was that news became profitable, and so the money people came into the news, and so then that's how it changed. Money people were attracted to money, naturally. And then the star system followed and everything else. But this fundamental thing that happened was that the forces that were in, in place before that were all pushing us to be better than we were. I had these icons. I was, I was in the men's room with these guys that I used to listen to. I couldn't believe it. You'd have to say hello to them, and they'd say hello back. And uh, after that, the forces began to ask you and to force you to do less than what you could do for the last 12 years. Less time, less resources, less research, less knowledge, that kind of thing. I want to tell you one story, and then I'll quit. And, and it's a point. It has a point. In, in Turfan, China, about four years ago. This is before the events at Tiananmen Square when reform was still the big thing in China. It's still big, but it was the only thing in China then that on, on the public agenda. Turfan, we were out in western China, which is in Xinjiang province, and, and it's in the desert there, and Turfan is the lowest place in China, very hot, fed by underground streams, and melted snow coming from the waters. Marvelous, magical place. It was our last visit there. This is for NBC. And we were watching people pick uh, grapes um, in, a, in a field uh, next to a minaret. This is Muslim country. And uh, an old man, wonderful old man with sort of a Ho Chi Minh beard, came over and asked what we were doing. And we told him, and this was his field. He invited us to his house walls that thick made of mud. He was a raisin maker. And the odor of the raisins were wonderfully sweet. We sat down and we talked and turned out his father, camera was rolling, turned out his father had owned hundreds of acres around here. And he was farming about 10 or 12 of those acres of his father. His life had gone from before the revolution through the cultural revolution up to the current reform. Muslims suffered a great deal in the Cultural Revolution. He had a hell of a story he could tell, but of course he couldn't tell it to me because the translator worked for the government and, every you know, the government had ears. 
Well, toward the end of this interview, tears came to his eyes, and I'm sorry, I looked at the camera and I said, meaning type close up. Of course, he did. And the, tra and the translation came back, and I had it retranslated in New York because we were going through two translators. And here's what he said He said, I'm so glad you're here today. I, my father and my mother are dead. Um, but I wish they were alive today so they could meet you because no one ever asked me about my life before. Well, in a country of a billion people, this man had a moment, and his moment showed me that all of the policies and all the geopolitics that we get involved in reporting and in enacting are really lived out in the lives of people with names. His name is Baha Wu Dun. And memories, they experience it. And so I, I know an awful lot of people like that. And I won't tell you any more stories, but if any of you uh, are attracted to the idea of journalism, come on in. We really need your help. And I'm looking forward to being here. I really thank you all for letting me in and uh, getting to know these young people, wonderful young people. I met somebody who's going to Harvard so she can be a good high school teacher. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you. John. Bill Hedna. Thank you very much, Charlie. Good evening. It's, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. It's a, a real a thrill, and I have a feeling of a sense of privilege about being associated with such a, a wonderful group of uh, fellow fellows, if I can use the phrase, uh, with uh, such a wonderful university, and with all the students who are involved here at the JFK School and the uh, IOP. And my wife and I are really looking forward to the time and to the study group that we're going to be involved in and to the discussions and the interaction with all of you. Before I go any further, since I'm the only fellow here with a spouse, I think I should introduce her, my wife, Beverly. Since we're sort of telling our personal histories this evening, I'll be glad to share with you some of mine. Uh, like John, I am a, a child of the manse, and my father was a, a clergyman. And uh, I grew up and went to uh, Princeton because my father and my uncle and my cousins and my grandfather had all gone to Princeton. And ours was a family that was uh, sort of in a rut. Dad, <laughs> Dad said, you can go anywhere you want, but I'll pay your way if you go to Princeton. So <laughs> and uh, Princeton had this ideal of uh, Princeton in the nation's service. And uh, then after that, I went to Union Seminary, uh, where I studied with people like Paul Tillich and Reinhold Niebuhr, which was a great experience in and of itself. And after graduating from seminary, became a Presbyterian clergyman and served uh, churches in Buffalo, New York, and Annapolis, Maryland, before moving to Indianapolis, uh, where I assumed the pastorate of a large uh, Presbyterian church and was there for about nine years when I left to run for uh, Congress, uh, I preached the importance of being involved and evidently took my preaching seriously because ultimately I tried to become involved in uh, the secular world, if you want to put it that way, as a uh, uh, person who sort of left the congregationally based ministry to go, go into public service. And I don't have any regrets about the decision. I uh, was elected to Congress. In 1972, I had an understanding with the people of the church that if I wasn't elected, I'd come back, and if I was successful, I'd go on to Congress and resign from the church, which I did. And then uh, I discovered after two years in Congress in 1974 that the uh, people of Indianapolis missed me so much that the first time they had a chance to express themselves, they voted for me to come home. Uh, <laughs> which I took as quite a compliment. The, uh, <laughs> at least that's the way I tell it back there. The uh, person whom I'd beaten in 72 with a lot of help, you may remember from the uh, Nixon-McGovern split, Nixon carried my district by 15 points, I carried it by one. 
Um, Andy Jacobs, he's a uh, congressman today, he came back in 1974 and beat me. One of the wonderful things about politics is that we're still good friends. As a matter of fact, he's coming up here this weekend to visit uh, Beverly and me with his wife. And we're going to spend the weekend together. Um, and I'm grateful in retrospect that I did lose that election because it gave me an opportunity the next year to run for mayor. And uh, being a mayor, in my opinion, or being in the executive branch of government, as Charlie was and as Buddy Romer uh, was, is, in my opinion, much more satisfying than being in the legislative branch of government. People might disagree on that, but I think you have a lot more chance to have what you might call positive impact with your life. Uh, I, I think government's a tremendous place to try to have a positive impact with your life, period. But within the framework of government, I personally uh, really have enjoyed being the mayor of Indianapolis now for 16 years. Uh, talk about close elections. When I was getting started and ran for Congress, I won the primary. There were 45,000 votes cast in May of 1972 in that particular primary. I won by uh, 82 votes. And so my opponent demanded a recount, and after the recount, my, my total went up to uh, 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 grand margin of 98 votes, which is why they call me Landslide Hudnut back in Indianapolis. And uh, that's a good illustration of the importance of a single vote because there are 400 precincts in that particular congressional district. And I win by 98 votes, which means if 50 people had swung their votes the other way, I would have lost instead of won never got involved in politics in an electoral way, and the nation would never have had the benefit of my service. <laughs> <laughs> on and on and on. But 50 people in 400 precincts, that means I won that particular election by one-eighth of a vote per precinct. So I think I know something about the value of, of, of a vote. People used to say to me when I was getting started in politics, uh, um, there are two extremes. Most of the people in the middle didn't care whether I was an ordained clergyman or not. And there was a group of about 10 percent on one end who said, oh, we think it's wonderful that a clergyman's going into politics because we need good Christian people. That always made me uncomfortable, incidentally, when they said that to me for various reasons, which we don't have time to go into. On the other end, there were people who said I had no business doing it. I'll not forget the president of the Power and Light Company in Indianapolis, who happened to be a member of my congregation, and our church was a big, huge Presbyterian church about 12 miles out on North Meridian Street, and at the center of our town is a circle. And he grabbed me literally by the lapels one day on the circle. He was a very feisty kind of a guy. And uh, he said, what are you doing going into politics? And I tried to explain to him. He said, preacher, you get your ass back up on Meridian Street where you belong. <laughs> I didn't take his advice any more than I took the advice of an old uh, bishop of the church who said to me when I was ordained way back uh, in 1957, he said, son, you want to get ahead in the church? I said, yes, sir. He says, well, then there's two things you must never talk about. And I said, what's that? He said, politics and religion. <laughs> I said, why? He said, because people argue about both of them, and you can never be right. Well, anyway. I, uh, as I say back in Indianapolis, fell from grace and went into politics, went to Congress. I was there just long enough to come to agree with Will Rogers, who says that the opposite of progress in our country is Congress. And then I lost, and then I ran for mayor and was elected in 75 and reelected in 79, 83, and 87. And this year, voluntarily decided not to run again. There are three ways to leave office, and two of them aren't any good. <laughs> you can die or you can lose. And um, I, I, I just decided that 16 years was enough. But I've really enjoyed being mayor of a large city, and that's what our study group's going to be about, because the city's under siege today. Uh, mayors are people who do a lot more than just provide basic city services. That's what you expect from local government. We have to plow the snow. We have to pick up the trash. We make, have to make sure that the chuck holes get filled and the sewers run downhill. And uh, those of us who uh, work at this uh, really want ours to be a city that works. I think Seattle was a city that worked under Charlie. I hope Indianapolis was a city that worked under Bill Hudnut. But, and you have to do that as a minimum. You have to provide those services. I remember once after an ice storm, and we hadn't been able to pick up the trash. You're mentioning Martin Luther King, Jr. reminded me of this because we were the first city in the country to set aside Martin Luther King, Jr.'s birthday as a holiday. 
And uh, we had a great ice storm in late January, and I can't remember, 1977 or 8, somewhere along in there. On Saturday morning of that weekend, a person came up to my door, found me at home, and just literally banged on the door. I knew he was mad because the icicles were all melting as I opened the door. And, and uh, can I help you? You bet you can help me. I said, well, what's your problem? He said, my trash hasn't been picked up. And I said, well, I'm sorry. My wife's out with the station wagon, or maybe we can help you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you get fresh with me, buddy. He says, my trash hasn't been. Well, he had a real problem because that particular winter, uh, Christmas was a Thursday, so he didn't get it. He was on the Thursday trash collection route, so his trash didn't get picked up. New Year's Day was on a Thursday, so he didn't get his trash picked up. Two weeks later, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, the trash didn't get picked up. Then came the ice storm, and the trash didn't get picked up. So he left, and uh, in a fit of distemper, I went out and took the numbers off our mailbox because, <laughs> you know, a person's home is their castle and I didn't want to be interrupted and all the rest of it. And uh, a couple days later, the neighborhood had a meeting and they elected a spokesman to come over and see me. His name was Johnny B. Smith. Um, really was his name, John Smith. And he said, Bill, the neighbors had a, a vote this evening and they'd like you to put your numbers back up on the mailbox. <laughs> I said, well, well, Johnny B, this is a true story, Johnny B, I said to him, uh, we, I, I don't want to do that. Last Saturday morning, this crazy guy came, he said, that's just the point. He says, if some nut comes down our street looking for the mayor's house to bomb, we want to make sure he hits the right one. <laughs> But a mayor has to pick up the services. He has to keep the city going. He has to balance the budgets, he or she. <coughs> and uh, it's a tremendous challenge in and of itself. But I have a wider view of uh, government than that, of leadership than that. Uh, I, I don't want to just be a, a caretaker and have tried to be uh, proactive in my philosophy of government. And so we uh, uh, went out and tried to put deals together. I like uh, moving the Colts from Baltimore to Indianapolis, which is probably what I'll be remembered for in history, the guy who stole the Colts. Uh, I don't know whether any of you are into that or not or remember that or not, but I took an awful lot of heat uh, for going after the Baltimore Colts. We built an $80 million uh, dome stadium. You talk about risk, we had no uh, chance uh, or no prospect of getting a team. And then all of a sudden the Colts fell into our lap. And I remember one night at the Sullivan Awards dinner in Indianapolis, which go, is the awards dinner for the Amateur Athlete of the Year, with the exception of football, which is the Heisman Trophy. All the media swarmed up to me and said, put their cameras and their microphones under my nose, and they Sorry. say to me, uh, <laughs> what are you trying to do, steal the Colts? And I said, well, what do you want me to do, sit on the sidelines of history and watch the river flow by and eat bonbons? Any mayor worth his or her salt is going to get in there and hustle for their community and try to create economic development opportunity and expand the tax base and make for more jobs and build the city up and all the rest of it. And, and that's the exciting part of uh, what being a mayor is all about. So now I'm done with being mayor. I've been mayor for 16 years, a congressman for two years. I look back over these uh, 18 or 19 years and... Uh, uh, in a sense, you have to struggle to avoid being uh, disillusioned by the political process because there's a lot that can grind you down. It's not just that my hair was black when I started in as mayor or that I was six foot ten and now I'm only six foot six. But the, uh, th there's a lot of frustration because you can't accomplish what you want. There's the uh, negativism of campaigns, which have really soured over the years that I've been in politics, and I was, in a sense, victimized by what I uh, considered a, a very, very negative campaign in 1990, which I don't have time to go into. Uh, you can get disillusioned by the uh, cynicism of the press, with all due respect, who are on you all the time and always expecting the worst or attributing the worst motives to you and putting the things that you do in uh, what some of us sometimes think of the worst possible light. And I, you can also be depressed by the irrationality of people who react so emotionally and tend to focus everything down to a single issue and oversimplify everything and, and uh, make it very tough uh, on you when you're in, in public life like when we were trying to establish a new landfill in Indianapolis and nobody wanted it in their backyard and all hell broke loose all over town. And yet I've got to take care of 2,200 tons of trash a day as a big city mayor. What am I going to do? 
Well, that's the kind of thing we'll be talking about in, in our study group. And yet, not to leave it on a negative uh, note, there's a lot that's positive. Public service is very, very rewarding, very, very fulfilling. Uh, having the opportunity to be where the action is is very exciting because in politics and in government, you're making decisions that affect millions and millions of dollars and the lives of hundreds of thousands of people and you're being able to put programs together and build a city and overcome the cacophony of modern urban life with some measure of, of harmony and bringing peace out of discord. And, and all this is, is satisfying. You have an opportunity to affect positive change, which I think is what leadership's all about. Let me just leave you with a quotation. Uh, John left you with a story. This is something that I discovered when I was in the Congress. And I, contrary to what I tell people back in Indianapolis, didn't have a lot of time to wax eloquent on the floor of the Congress because I was the lowest of the low. I was a, a freshman and I was a Republican. And you didn't get any lower than that in the United <laughs> States Congress. <laughs> So I'd look around and my mind would wander just as maybe yours has for the last 10 minutes while I've been talking. <laughs> and uh, I'd uh, uh, look at the uh, frescoes on the wall of Lafayette and Washington and look at the American flag in back of the speaker's chair where people like Tip O'Neill and George Bush used to fall asleep during President Reagan's <laughs> State of the Union speech. And then up above that and up above the uh, a press gallery engraved in the keystone of the arch of the United States House of Representatives were some words which, uh, from Daniel Webster, which seemed to me to bespeak the, uh, the challenge and the opportunity and the, the privilege that is ours today in politics and in government, said Webster. And I think they're, they're beautiful words. Let us develop the resources of our land. Call forth its powers. Build up its institutions promote all its great interests, and see whether or not we also, in our day and generation, may not accomplish something worthy to be remembered. And that's what we're trying to do, and it's our job to keep that dream alive. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Yelena Kanga. First of all, I want to thank you so much for inviting me here because you should understand for an ordinary child from Soviet Union, Soviet disunion, <laughs> from Russia where I was born, just in the most brave dreams, you would never think that I could end up sitting at this table with those distinguished fellows. <laughs> and I mean, in my newspaper where I worked for seven years, I wouldn't ever dare to sit down at the same table with my editor-in-chief in the dining room because we have a very strict hierarchy who could sit with whom. And here I just see, yes, this is democracy. <laughs> uh, I was born in Moscow. I was a typical Moscow, Moscovite. And the only difference between me and other kids was that I was black. And there were not many black kids at the time, so I don't really understand where the drink black Russian came from in America. <laughs> so I started my career, I guess, as a tennis player, and I played 10 years in the team called Soviet Army Team, and I was very proud of that. Then I went to, I quit playing tennis, and I went to Moscow State University. It's sort of Harvard of Soviet Union. And I went to school, school of journalism, that is considered to be the school of brides. Brides, the girls that are getting married. The reason why it was called school of brides is because we were not really tortured by our teachers, uh, but we were taught, you know, how to say a couple of sentences in several languages, how to look nice, to smile. And usually at the end of the fifth year, the guys who were planning to become diplomats or journalists abroad, they would come to choose the wife at my school. So that was a very prestigious place to be. And I really wanted to see where the School of Journalism here in Harvard is the same School of Brides, <laughs> just to check it. <laughs> Um, it was very difficult for me to find a job when I graduated from school, and not because I was black, but because I was female first, and in my country there's a very strong competition for jobs, and usually male gets it, no matter how dumb he is. But, <laughs> oh, I mean, 
I don't mean, I'm talking about Soviet Union, okay, not about America. So, <laughs> nothing personal. <laughs> but because my um, grandparents were Americans, and that was, that was really bothered KGB, so I was already um, ready to be one of the first Soviet unemployed. That's what we thought, that there were no unemployment. So I thought I would be the first. But Gennady Gerasimov, uh, the editor-in-chief of Moscow News, just felt sorry for me, and he hired me. Gerasimov later became the spokesman of Gorbachev. And I think he's very famous here in America. You might see him on TV. Uh, so Moscow News was one of the most propaganda newspaper in the Soviet Union, and I had a column, uh, News of Interest. In other words, uh, I was interviewing foreigners, mostly Americans, that came to Soviet Union. And since that was before Glasnost and Perestroika, I figured out very fast that I had to interview only people who really loved Soviet Union, since that was not e uh, easy to find that kind of people. <laughs> <laughs> I would ask the interest guide f from the group who is really in love with my country, and he would say, this one, this one, because during the tour he was saying, oh, how beautiful is, how clean is Moscow, how wonderful are Russian women. So I would go interview those people and then would write an article in which this person would say that the grass in Soviet Union is the greenest in the world and the sun is the warmest. <laughs> and these articles worked, and I was doing good money, and I thought that's, that's what journalism is all about. But then Gorbachev came, and Glasnost came, a new editor-in-chief came, Mr. Yakovlev, and I remember he invited everybody to the room, and he said, now, what is in common between the minister in the government and the fly? Do you know? Well, nobody knew. He said, both minister in the government and the fly can be killed by the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> So that was like, wow, <laughs> I want to try that. <laughs> and uh, new journalism, you know, people got used to that, not that fast. People still had a censorship inside. And I would, like, I would be writing an article in the evening criticizing somebody from the government, my mother would come and she would say, well, you don't really want to do that. Let, you know, anybody else do. Just, you know, let's see. You never know how it turns out, Gorbachev or somebody. Just play it safe. Uh, but, uh, so, I guess our journalist five years ago was like a dog. Oh, okay. And, uh, another thing that to understand it is uh, uh, when a journalist w was writing, before Gorbachev, they would say, I'm really great in writing. The only problem is we have a censorship, we have an editor that cuts off everything. So that's why my articles turned out bad, but usually I'm <laughs> real great. So when censorship was gone, and still the articles were still dull, and our editor said, well, you are like do a dog that sits on the chain and barks when you pass, and it barks and barks. And then when you let the dog off the chain, the dog doesn't know what to do. It's like, well, you know, n nobody taught her how to bite. <laughs> and I guess Yakovlev did a very good job how to teach our journalists how to bite. And very soon our press became like watchdogs of our government, and we were, American press was for us the symbol. And very soon the journals became heroes, and they would be stopped in the street, and you know, people would shake hands and give them a kiss sometimes. And uh, even we had some jokes that um, we didn't have lots of kids coming out because during the honeymoon, young people, instead of making kids, were discussing last articles in newspapers. <laughs> uh, so, um, and the Moscow News, my newspaper, beca became one of the most political newspaper, and it is published in 10 languages, and maybe you've read it. Um, and in order to buy Moscow News, you had to get up at 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning and stand in line, and that was considered to be a very good present from a, a guy to give to a girl, just the latest issue of Moscow News. Um, 
I was very lucky five years, no, six years ago in 1987 to become the first Soviet journalist who worked in an American newspaper that was Christian Science Monitor. Uh, that was exchange program. Then journalists came to work in my newspaper. So I came to America first time in my life, and it was like Alice in Wonderland. And I guess I picked two diseases in America. First disease was I started fighting with smoking, and I failed because I remember how I returned back to my newsroom where I was in the room with seven males who were smoking, they could write a word without smoking, and I was complaining, and they said, well, fine, you don't like it, leave the newspaper, because there are 10 of us smoking, you're the only one that doesn't smoke. So I decided to go to complain to my editor-in-chief, and I came into the room, and he was smoking, and he said, Elena, what's your problem? <laughs> and I said, well, never mind, it's okay. And the other disease was I became a feminist. So... Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, in Soviet Union, it's not exactly the same meaning <laughs> that's here. But um, the reason why I became a feminist is in my country, females uh, were allowed to write about anything they wanted except politics. Uh, I mean, a woman could be real good at writing about culture, about sport, about anything, but she couldn't put two, they thought, males thought, that she couldn't put two words together about America or anything, you know, anything real serious of, um, in the world. So we decided to make a group, 33 plus one. That was a group of 33 uh, journalists, female journalists plus one. We were cho choosing a hero, a man, um, in the government. So we sent the letters to many politicians, and the first person who invited us was the Prime Minister of Russia, Soviet Union. We went to Kremlin to meet with him. Second was Shavarnadze. And the third person, he was the most interesting person to speak with. He turned out to be the head of KGB, who lately was the initiator of the coup that happened um, last summer. So that was very interesting because the, I guess not many foreigners and Soviet people were in the office of the head of KGB. And he started his meeting by saying, Look at the door uh, and the handle of the door. You might notice that it is used much more from outside than from inside. A nice joke you know, for beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I really understood that American journalists are much more braver than we Soviets because when I was asking him the question, I would ask, well, what do you write? Uh, what do you like to read in the morning? <laughs> American journalist got up and she asked, uh, can you prove me that my telephone is not bugged and nobody follows me when I'm going for an interview? So each time when American was putting the hand, he was pretending that he doesn't see it. He was like, Yelena, you have some more questions? <laughs> yeah. And then when American would put her question, he was like, oh boy, some more American journals. How many of you are there here? So th that was real fun. Um, uh, I also was invited on the Soviet television to cover America. Uh, I guess that was the result of our fight uh, because people trusted me since I was not you know, employee of TV and nobody could tell me what to do. And I made some pieces in America about yuppies uh, <laughs> and about gangs. Uh, the gangs was very funny because the guy explained that if you are dressed in the wrong dress, you can be killed in the street. So during the show, it was live, I got a phone call when a Soviet guy said, well, that's not our problem because we are dressed not uh, what we want to wear, not the colors that we want to wear, but the colors that we can get. So all the gangs will be confused. They'll never know who is who. Um, so um, I, I spent one year in the Rockefeller Foundation last summer, uh, last year, and I guess that was my introduction. In, um, that's how I was introduced to the world of capitalist sharks, and that's how we were told in Soviet Union. You, they told me, Elena, be dangerous. They are sharks. But after the year, I figured out they're so nice 
wonderful sharks. <laughs> and then I had a feeling that there was communism. Actually, that's what I guess Lenin was dreaming about, you know, when everybody has everything and everybody loves everything. That was in Rockefeller Foundation. So my Russian... <laughs> So my Russian friends would call me and say, well, Yelena, is there another place in the world of sharks, the Rockefeller Foundation? We would like to yeah, share that life with them. <laughs> so now I, um, I guess I, uh, being a journalist in Soviet Union, I do understand how the Soviet politics works. And I'm here now. I really want to understand how American politics work. That's why I'm here. And another thing that I want to find out, and this is very important, in the Soviet Union, they always told us that you think that in America there are many parties. Okay, there are Democrats and there are Republicans. No, actually, there isn't. There is one party. So I want to understand whether they were true or not, whether there is a big difference between Democrats and conservatives. Uh, Republicans, and we were talking with Tom today about this big difference. He couldn't explain me. So that's what I'm going to spend time trying to figure out the difference. And also, um, I want to invite, you know, if somebody's interested about what's going on in the Soviet Union, not from outside what you can read in any time or New York Times, because they are very accurate right now. But I'm going to speak about Soviet Union from inside, what do ordinary people feel, how a person can survive on two dollars salary a month, and in what people believe, you know, youth and problems of Soviet females, that's what I went through. Thank you. Thank you, Yelena. Uh, Betsy Wright. Well, Elena says that she wants to figure out how American politics work, and most of us are trying to figure out how to make American politics work. Um, I usually, when asked how I got into politics, reply by saying that I was born into it, going on to explain that my father was a county Democratic chairman. However, it was more basic than that. I was born on the 4th of July. <laughs> And uh, my parents predictably had a shortage of, of knowledge of female role models in American history, and I became Betsy. Um, I was the ninth of 12 children born to a country doctor um, who taught us that there was no price too great to pay to stand by our convictions. And probably the highest example that he paid in his life was that he was kicked out of his church for supporting Al Smith, a Catholic, for president. And it was a pain that never left him, but it was something that he never looked back on with regret. And it had a big impact on me many years later. When I was five years old, I had an experience which taught me that I could be a political leader in this country. Uh, Harry Truman came to Alpine, Texas, where I lived on his whistle-stop tour, and I went with my father to help him place the proverbial Stetson on Harry Truman's head. From that, I knew that I was well qualified to be successful in politics and dedicated myself to putting hats on presidents' heads for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, growing up in a very rural county of Texas, uh, Political leadership did come to me very early. By the time I was 15, I was serving as a county coordinator for congressional and gubernatorial candidates. Now, the truth of the matter is that there are 376,000 counties in Texas, most of whom have very few people, including mine. Large land space, I think three New England count, uh, states would fit into the, this, this county, but there were very few people. And they, they, there was an obsession by candidates that there be a name by every one of these hundreds of thousands of counties. And so by the time I was 15, I was the name on a lot of campaigns. Then I went off to college and discovered that there were a lot of other young people interested in this stuff too. Began a pattern, didn't realize then it was going to be a pattern, but which has continued through my life, which is to pursue a passion of getting people involved in politics and government. Uh, I, I 
at that time, uh, living in Austin, Texas, worked uh, in voter registration reform. We required that people register every single year in order to vote, and that registration closed in January for a May election. Uh, I worked for Barbara Jordan during those days and found her to be a remarkable uh, role model uh, and inspiration to me. I worked also very hard on the ratification of the 18-year-old vote amendment. Uh, the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement had a profound impact on me, and I went through a point of great, great disillusionment about politics in this country. Boyd considerably when we almost elected Sissy Farron, the old governor of Texas in 1972, a reformer, uh, and I worked for Sissy. I then worked in the McGovern campaign where I had another extremely disillusioning experience. In, in what was one of the most demoralizing periods of my life, I suffered what I now know the name to be sexual harassment uh, by a man that the McGovern campaign sent in to run the Texas campaign, who every time I dared to argue with him about a particular strategy, um, he began making comments about my hormones or asking me when was the last time I had been laid. It had, it had a dreadful impact on me. I was very depressed about it. But I found great support from two friends who had also come to Texas to work in that campaign and have remained friends for the next 20 years in Bill and Hillary Clinton. And um, I went on to help after that campaign organize the National Women's Political Caucus, which Sissy, who I was working for, became the first national president of. Hillary had gone to some obscure school I'd never heard from off in another country called Wellesley. Um, <laughs> and had from there a network that included not only Democrats, but some other kinds of people I'd really never heard of called Republicans, uh, who had formed a board for an organization called the National Women's Education Fund, which was to recruit and train women to be candidates and campaign managers. And Hillary convinced me to go work for the Education Fund as its founding executive director, which I did for seven years. I got to work in politics in all but two states in this country. Those were very heady days in the 70s. I got to touch the successful elections of over 2,000 women to school boards, county boards, city councils, and state legislatures. Um, I, I finally began to regard Washington as the Fort Lauderdale of political activism. And I felt very hypocritical about being there while traveling the country trying to convince women to run campaigns and run for office. And so I went to the front lines. I moved to Little Rock. Uh, my friend Bill Clinton had just been defeated in his first re-election attempt for governor of Arkansas and I put together his comeback campaign in 82 and ran his uh, subsequent campaigns. I served as his chief of staff for seven years. The most extraordinary experience, too few people ever get the experience of being a governor's chief of staff. It is a, a very rare opportunity, which I highly recommend. Uh, I mean, you learn about things you never even knew were there to learn about. I know how to use the National Guard to feed millions of chickens when the weather is freezing and they can't get trucks to them. I, <laughs> I have experienced sitting in a room with Sam Walton and six CEOs of, man, of American manufacturers while they tell him why he gives preferable treatment how he gives preferable treatment to manufacturers overseas, out of which grew his Buy America campaign. Um, I have agonized over prison administration, and I have particularly endured the agony of capital punishment. I served as a lightning rod to the governor. Um, at one point, uh, when I had pushed the governor and everybody else just about to the wall over instituting ethics legislation. And the legislature was very resentful. Uh, the governor obviously was very supportive, but you know, when you like governors and you like Bill, gosh, Bill's such a likable guy, you don't want to be mad at him, so you're mad at 
me. Uh, and he, we, we, took, we put an act on the ballot to uh, pass, an uh, initiated act on the ballot to impose lobbyist disclosure and ethics. Uh, and of course it passed. You don't lose things like that when it goes to a vote of the people. The legislature had failed to pass it. And there was great resentment on the part of particularly some old line powerful retrograde senators who held hostage his legislative package the next session with a demand that I be fired. Uh, he, he obviously didn't cave to that, but it was also our least successful legislative session. Seven years was too long to stay. I was burned out. I felt like I was losing my own identity in the process. I should have left at least a year earlier. Uh, it was, leaving was the most difficult thing of my life, to walk away from that kind of power. Uh, although my life has been much better since. Um, <laughs> I spent the next um, six months as a volunteer, unemployed, on my own, campaign consultant, and defeated those recalcitrant senators in the Democratic primary. And Bill Clinton had the, same, the best session ever the next time, because at that point I became chair of the Democratic Party of Arkansas and uh, served as its executive director. Um, I had a lot of fun in the year I spent as chair of the Democratic Party. Uh, I have a lot of radical ideas about what needs to happen to my party and to the Republican Party to make them relevant again. And, and it means coming out of tradition in the dark ages and into a modern day and time. Um, the, um, the, the question always is, so why are you here and why aren't you in the presidential campaign? It hasn't been long enough since I began the struggle to find myself. Um, and I have a major role in the campaign. I, um, I, I spend an enormous amount of time doing backgrounders as a 20-year friend and aide uh, with the national press. I also provide moral support, which is taking an awful lot of more time and effort than I ever dreamed uh, it would take. Um, since I left the Democratic Party, I have put considerable energies uh, into trying to cap ways to capitalize on the new American awareness of sexual harassment issue in this country, and most particularly how to increase the impact of women in office since it is taking so slow, such a long time to increase their numbers and that there have to be simultaneous power acquisition uh, activities that go on. Um, while I was chair of the Democratic Party, I did a lot of struggle for how to get college kids interested in politics. And you all are sitting in a very rarefied uh, atmosphere, and I know you don't therefore have an understanding of what it's like on most campuses. Um, I grew up in a time when you couldn't cross the street without being uh, swept into some social movement. It was very easy to be involved. Uh, when I was in college, it was hard not to be involved in politics. And undergraduate students today don't have that kind of environment. And yet my generation has forsaken its responsibility in manufacturing bridges that bring young people into politics a different way. Uh, without the social movements. It flat is not easy for most college kids, if they are interested in politics, to know how to be active and involved in them. Um, I grew up in a time when I believed that, when I, I grew up believing that I know not only could, but that I had to make a difference in this country and in its government. Uh, my study group is on the technology of politics, and that's because I want I want people to know the skills of it so that they will then be able to act on their beliefs uh, and the convictions that go with it. And it's a great honor to be here. Well, I think you can see why at the Institute of Politics um, we feel that our mission, um, which is, as Betsy just described it, to build those bridges, is going to be served 
uh, by the presence of these uh, fine fellows. Uh, let's uh, begin uh, with a few minutes of questioning, and we'll start with Christine, who always asks, asks really one of the tougher questions of the <laughs> evening. No. Um, what turns a lot of people, especially young people, off from politics is when po politicians are run by ideologies and not by ideas. And I'd like to ask the fellows how you'd suggest getting involved in politics, getting active in politics without getting too I ideological. Okay. Don't look at me. <laughs> well, let me, uh, can I start? Please. I don't hear anybody else jumping to the floor here. Um, I was in Congress for two years, as I mentioned, and was much more driven by ideology then, perhaps because of my lack of practical experience, than I have been as mayor. And uh, being involved in running a large city is, is something that requires a great deal of pragmatism, and ideology doesn't make any difference. The way Charlie Royer, a Democrat, and Bill Hudnut, a Republican, deal with city problems is probably pretty much the same. And I think you have to avoid eschewing ideology because ideology forces you sometimes into uh, oversimplification and into uh, reductios ad absorbum and into uh, uh, situations where you tend to uh, uh, be driven by a single issue. Let me give you one example and then I'll hush. But it was right here at Harvard and I, I was invited to, by Jonathan Moore to come here in 1984 in June to a fill-in for Jimmy Carter, who canceled out on them at the last minute in a jointly sponsored conference between the Divinity School and the JFK School. And it was on politics and religion or whatever, and there was a whole spread of people of all different kinds and shapes of opinion, all, ideolo ideologies all over the place, from people over here who represented the so-called Christian right to people over here who represented the Civil Liberties Union. And one of those people from the Christian right, I'll never forget it as long as I live, came up to me during a break and asked me what my views on abortion were. And I said, well, you know, really, a mayor doesn't have much uh, to say about that. It's driven by the legislature, by the Supreme Court, et cetera. Um, I said, don't, don't you care about what I've done in education, housing, transportation, race relations, et cetera, et cetera? And he said, no said, the only thing that we're interested in is uh, what your view on abortion is. He said, we're out to defeat everybody in public life who doesn't support the right to life. And I just shrugged my shoulders and uh, walked away from him. And uh, I've never forgotten how horrified I was by that kind of an ideologically driven approach uh, to politics. And I try to eschew it as much as I can. Oh, over here, to yeah. Ross. <laughs> um, this is a question which uh, this is especially for Tom, Bill, and Betsy. Um, we're all kind of thinking about what we're going to do and whether we want to get involved or not. Um, and you could, it seems that you guys have chosen two different routes. You've chosen to either run for political office or to be, be the people behind the people that run for political office. And I just wanted to know how you kind of made those decisions and what advice you have for us in deciding whether we want to be part of politics or we actually want to run for office. I'll be glad to start. Uh, in many ways, the decision gets made for you. Uh, running for public office uh, isn't easy. And, and uh, you'll get elected or you'll get you won't be elected, and I think it's a it's a personal uh, a personal decision beyond that. And I, in, in a very personal way, I could tell you that uh, um, I felt I I could offer more in terms of the skills I had. But I also tell you something that I wasn't willing to pay the price, uh, and it is by way of compliment. Uh, and I don't know that people uh, enough people understand and, and have respect for the price that elected officials pay in terms of their personal lives and what it means in terms of uh, sacrificing privacy and time away from family, et cetera. And uh, it's, it's a very personal decision. I think, it, again, it'll, one, in one respect, it'll get made for you in another. But there's plenty of, of uh, more opportunities to work in than run. There are a limited number of offices to go around. But don't, you know, um, don't be discouraged if you, uh, if you were to choose the, the direction of running get defeated because there'll be a candidate looking for you somewhere to you know, the one thing I learned about politics was, was not so much what to do. I know a lot about what not to do, and I try to impart that 
uh, knowledge to candidates? I have a very simple answer to that. I wanted power. Uh, and the decision, I, I knew that I had to have power in order to make changes in this society and to influence them. And while I certainly didn't stand in front of the Arkansas Senate and say, I want power, uh, I mean, they were terrified enough about this alien creature that came from Mars to be the chief of staff in Arkansas. Uh, I knew that I had to go the best route possible to have a lot of influence. I was certainly not the first woman in the state of Arkansas ever qualified to be the governor's chief of staff. I am the first one that ever had a governor who let me have the opportunity I earned. Uh, and Bill and I both say that the true test of our success will be when the next governor has a woman chief of staff, that we will not know until then. Uh, but my decision to go into it was purely wanting power, and I want women to be comfortable with wanting power. Yes, sir. Uh, one, recently here at the Institute, we celebrated our 25th anniversary, and one of our themes was revitalizing American democracy. My question to the fellows is, as part of that, how do you see the parties revitalizing dem American democracy. If you don't see it, then I'd like to hear some type of alternative. And if you do, I want to know how. And was it a third party, or is it something that the parties can do to change? I'll be glad to start with that, since I have the most experience here with third parties. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, about, it's about choices. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't easy for someone who put as much time and effort as I did personally into uh, the two-party system. I really viewed it as an effort that, you know, uh, entailed being part of a two-party system, not being a Republican or a Democrat, but choices. And people, I can answer this indirectly, people uh, in their collective wisdom know something about what they want. And we saw that manifested in a race in Connecticut. I will tell you, Lowe Weicker is not the most lovable, popular, likable guy, <laughs> as opposed to Betsy seems to have a boss that was very likable. Very lovable. In my case, everyone liked me, so it was, you know. <laughs> but I think the only way that, that the message is going to get sent, and I, I did everything up to and including trying to open up the party process by allowing uh, such a uh, 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 forward thinking in the state of Connecticut is opening up the primary to let independents vote in primaries, which is, should not have been a big deal and took that all the way to the Supreme Court. And finally, uh, won that case only to have a party turn its back on it. So it needed the process and the two parties needed, I decided, uh, along with some other dedicated friends, uh, other choices. And I think given those other choices, um, that either one of two things is going to happen. We'll make those other two parties sit up and take notice and be more relevant, or there will be a permanent third party. It makes no difference to me. That's one of the reasons I'm here is to explore that. So long as they become uh, institutions that uh, get somehow grounded and understand who it is we're supposed to be serving, that it's not about an exercise of making sure that the Democrats or the Republican incumbents always stay in office. And that's what it's become, and I think people have seen through that. There, the, the political party, I really am a strong believer in political parties. I'm not threatened by multiple parties. Uh, because in a third party effort, a strong Republican party, all makes my party be more focused and more shape, shaped by that. Uh, but, and I speak mostly as a Democrat, we absolutely have to stop resisting the changes that have taken place in a technological society, and we have to become a modern-day political party. We are practically irrelevant right now. People want to know what the, what the parties believe in. Under tradition, that is all spelled out in something called a platform. We write it in the most farcical way imaginable. We write it the way it had to be written decades and decades ago before there was instant mass media, before there, when people literally had to come together to discuss and debate issues and to nominate someone. Ours is written now at a convention 
when we almost always know who the nominee is going to be. My party now operates ostensibly under a platform shaped by Michael Dukakis, who is nowhere in terms of the leadership of this country right now. Um, as a consequence, the party, I mean, the platform is not a guiding document. It is not debated by the leaders of the of the party, either elected or activist. It becomes a moment for uh, 15 minutes in the national press for our, for some of our most contentious subgroups. And I don't mean unimportant subgroups, but most people think that the Democratic Party watching the platform process play out at a convention is made up of people who are upset about abortion and gay rights and civil rights and whatever other kind of a very tough issue you can come with, and my party has never done anything to bring it together as a whole so that this country and Democrats had a sense of what we were as a whole. And furthermore, our elected officials do not dare participate in that process because it becomes very damaging to them. So our Democrats who hold office in Congress in the city councils, in the state legislatures, have no dialogue, have no policy-making functions. There is no such thing as a Republican policy or a Democratic policy. And they may talk one-on-one, -on -one, but it's not interjurisdictionally. And until we begin the platform process the day after elections, and we do it in a way that puts our elected officials with our party leaders interjurisdictionally, we will not have a modern day or relevant political party. <laughs> I agree with Betsy, and I think I could say ditto for the Republican Party as a, as a Republican. I am very saddened by the demise of the political parties, Marlon, and uh, I think it's almost a truism to point it out, but they are becoming more and more obsolete and irrelevant as money and TV become more and more important. And that goes right over the heads of the political party. And candidates who can raise the money can put on the TV, and usually it's negative ads, and they can win the elections. And the parties no longer have the functions uh, that are important in winning a political election that they did uh, a generation ago. And there's been this gradual erosion. Whether or not it will ever come back, I don't know. But with TV taking over uh, political campaigning and money driving TV, I don't see anything but a rather bleak future for the uh, future of the parties. Uh, and I don't think that in American history, with all due respect to uh, the independents in Connecticut, that third parties have ever worked very well. And, and I think that we've got the two parties who nominate the candidates in various different fashions and do try to come up with something of a platform, even though the process is terribly flawed. But the parties, I think, uh, have a very dim future. Can I just say one sure. thing about television? I think that uh, Congress can think seriously about requiring television to give free time and lots of it in the campaign in a rationally meted out way. We, uh, we're going to have a reception following uh, the um, forum in the living room of the Institute of Politics. So we have, what, three questioners? Let's try to do this. Uh, very briefly and brief answers, and then we'll move on to a reception where you can talk uh, informally with our fellows. Yes, sir. I just have a question for uh, Mayor Hudnett, uh, Congressman Hudnett. Um, you spoke about the problems of the cities and um, about problems of trash collection, and I presume also crime. Um, many people are concerned about the absence of um, local power. Reagan was elected uh, on the uh, 60 slogan, Power to the People. But as time goes on, uh, there seems to be less and less local power, either to tax or to spend. And um, we have welfare communities, because, which are the sizes of villages uh, or cities even years ago, which don't have any agency or power to um, affect their own lives with respect to taxation. Uh, as a mayor, uh, is there any sense that, um, that some solution to the cities might come about through localizing uh, control so that communities like Roxbury and Boston and elsewhere can take more active control over their lives with respect to some of the government services? Well, that's a tough question to answer in a couple of minutes. I think that the uh, answer is uh, uh, hopefully this can happen. I think most mayors would want this to happen. 
Uh, Reagan talked about the devolution of authority and responsibility back to state and local government. But the cities aren't even mentioned in the Constitution. We always get the short end of the intergovernmental partnership stick. We are at the end of the pipeline where a lot of the responsibility comes on us without having the funding capability or capacity to uh, meet the requirements, the mandates, uh, the obligations that are upon us. Uh, I think that the more we can do to localize government, the better. And uh, the long and the short of it is that insofar as it's possible, that's what local uh, government officials all across the country are working on to, to try to do just that. I don't know. Well, you don't want to say anything because you're the moderator. But you're the mayor of Seattle, man. <laughs> Will these be the last two questions then, okay? This question is directed at Mr. Hart and Ms. Conga. Um, you mentioned, Mr. Hart, that you can't think of a better way to have spent 20-some years as a journalist. 35. How many? 35. 35. And um, I assume you also enjoy what you do, Ms. Hart. I was wondering what it is about journalism that you feel is significant and um, satisfying to both of you um, beyond just the simple observation of the famous politicians and the political players and beyond the sense of power that you might feel when you get to write about these people to the general public. Um, how do you feel you particip participate in the overall process? Let me begin. Uh, <clears throat> I'm glad you asked that because it, I don't want to leave the impression that the only thing is that you get to meet famous people. And, and that's one of the corrosive factors in, in the practice of journalism. Everybody gets too happy about rubbing shoulders of the great and the near great. And the most satisfying um, experiences are meeting other people, to tell you the truth, who are able to be... Uh, more passionate and more candid and more forthright in their expressions to you and, and, and more open in the revelations of their lives, which do, uh, which do reveal in detail and, and uh, in microcosm the great events of our time. Uh, as a participate, you're in the truth business, and there's nothing more thrilling than that. Um, we were talking earlier about uh, the, the differences, and we'll be talking in the, in, in, the, in the study group about differences between journalists and, and politicians, and one of the differences is that politicians must care about the consequences of their words. Journalists must not care. And um, my pal Mort Saul, uh, in discussing this with me last night, said, yeah, well, one group uh, it tells the truth and the other takes the consequences. <laughs> but um, I don't mean to be flipped, but there, that's a very, it's exhilarating to do that. And you do play a role. There's no, forgive me for being naive, but, but there are no free people without a free press. And we have an obligation, and, which is increasingly difficult to fulfill, to inform fully because of the marketing and, and financial restraints that are put on us by non-journalists that own the organs of journalism. Um, but this can go on and on. If you want to stick around, we can talk about uh, more later. I guess Soviet journalism is different from American because here you're trying to be in, uh, independent and objective. In my country, all journalists are politicians. And when Gorby started his new uh, you know, po policy, journalists were the one to support him first. And when he want, he got scared of what he created and wanted maybe to slow down, journalists were the one not to let him do that. And if you look at the government, who's in the government right now, there are lots of journalists. And I guess what I like in journalism, you just feel that you're really involved in that and you can make the difference. Yes, sir. Mr. Hudna, you said that you felt you met with much, um, much greater personal success uh, on the state level, the local level, than in the Congress. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about what you think might, we should maybe do to um, make the Congress a place which is more appealing to good, strong local and state, gov um, local and state leaders, or if that's something we really want to do, or <coughs> is, is your route perhaps a, a good alternative that, that good, responsible leaders stay on the state level and, and work on a mo in a more local way there? Well, I really do feel that um, there are a couple of things that might 
make a difference. One, this was always a guaranteed applause line when I was speaking to local government groups, and that is to have my tongue's halfway in my cheek, have a constitutional amendment that requires anybody that runs for Congress to have at least five years of local or state government experience before they run. So they, they know what the hell's going on at the local level, because a lot of them don't. And they get over there in a foggy bottom, and they, they never learn. And they have no conception of the impact of what they pass on state and local government. The second thing, more realistically, is I happen to believe in term limitations. I don't know whether people around here do or not, but uh, it seems to me as though uh, – Betsy does years or? 16 years is fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can stay too long, and I think you can get uh, tired blood, and uh, I think that uh, the country needs new leadership and new vision from time to time, and that's why I decided not to run again. We uh, invite politicians and journalists to be fellows at the Institute of Politics, and I have to tell you that there's one piece of advice I got from an early role model of mine, a fellow who was the governor of the beloved state of Oregon that John and I both uh, come from, a fellow named Tom McCall, who was both a journalist and then a politician. He used to say that journalists ought to get into politics because if they've been in journalism for a while, they've had a good, solid graduate course in public affairs. They know something about the government, and they've looked at it critically and probably learned from it. Two, uh, he said <coughs> that, uh, that uh, journalists um, – have a good sense of smell. And he said they know corruption when they see it. Uh, and he said, thirdly, uh, they've been around enough big shots so that they know that uh, they shouldn't get a swelled head when they get into politics and that uh, they therefore make good politicians. So I started out as a journalist, went to be a politician, and I can tell you both are the most exciting careers that uh, you can possibly imagine. So I hope you rub shoulders with our journalists and politicians. and. Um, learn something from them, as I think we all have tonight. Thank you very much for your... Thank you.